Welcome to the Bigfoot Researcher's Journal. Today we're going to start off the show with an interview from my son. Uh, this is an hour after he saw the Bigfoot, 20 minutes after the park officials tried to cover it up and basically threatened me. In the end, uh, there's a program going on where they're studying the creatures. We've been saying this for a long time. And then catching the creatures that they're studying. Check this out. This is Christopher. This is Christopher, he's my son. He never believed that any of this was real until 2012 when I took him on his first expedition with me. We went to Mayaka State Park on the west coast of Florida. And over the course of three days, we both got more than we bargained for. And Christopher learned that just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not real. I, I was to the left and he was to the right, but I was up more. And there was uh, uh, like brushes and bushes in front of him. And in front of me, there was nothing. And there was this little walkway um, uh, that was clear. And, and then about 50 yards ahead of me, there was brushes. And as soon as I turn, I see some big black thing walking. And uh, it had very broad shoulders. Um, it was walking, you know, uh, kind of like it would be a power walk for us. Um, uh, uh, I couldn't make out the face because it was too far away. But it had a very big head, a very, you know, um, wide jaw, big jaw, bottom jaw. Um, it had a big chest and a real thick torso. This is the actual drawing that Christopher made within an hour of having his sighting. You can clearly see this is not a bear, and it sure isn't a raccoon. This drawing was actually made in the park ranger's office and the on-duty ranger told us that she was fully aware that people were seeing this in the park. And I was, you know, me not being a believer, I was like, what the hell, what, what is that, you know? Uh, so I, I was frozen and I was like, dad! And I was just, I was just in, I kind of like in shock. And he was like, what? He was like, I was like, it's over there, it's over there. Uh, I had seen it for like four seconds walking. Uh, I was walking this way when I saw it, and he was walking um, uh, perpendicular. And then finally, the palm fronds, uh, and, and, or, or the, 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 what are they called? Saw? Saw palmettos. Saw palmettos um, uh, got the way they were too high. But, even before uh, they got too high, they were already six feet um, high. The saw, uh, the saw palmettos, and he was at least four feet above that to where I could see him. And then finally, uh, I couldn't, you know, see him anymore. And then I kept running, I kept running. Finally, I saw him for one last second, and then uh, when we got to where I had first saw him. And then we were looking at him in the direction he was walking, and then this was in like less than 30 seconds, and he was just gone. He was gone. I don't know if he was hiding, if he was ducked down, or, or in the midst of those uh, saw palmettos, or what, but... After a careful examination of the brush and surrounding area, we determined that what Christopher saw was between 8 and 10 feet tall. That's my sighting. And then throughout the day, you know, we would hear branches break and everything. And, but I guess you could say I don't believe in that. Mark and Melanie spend a lot of time in their research areas. Every once in a while, something rare pops out of the bushes. 
like this Florida Bobcat. You can see it's got a tag in its left ear. So the team knows that there are biologists studying the wildlife inside these preserves. Now in 12 months of filming in this exact spot, this is the first and only bobcat they were able to film. But they've caught several Bigfoot on film. Are we really supposed to believe that these biologists can track, capture, and tag bobcats like this? And that they don't notice the clan of archaic human primates living in the exact same areas as the bobcats? The team doesn't buy it. If the general public can film a Bigfoot in this exact spot, so can those who are tasked with studying the wildlife in this area. Okay, we just came out of swamp and found about a 14 inch track barefoot and we had difficulty finding the next tracks or the previous tracks. Um, there was a lot of patchy grass in the area and there was some really hard sand. Um, my track didn't leave any mark hardly. Um, and then coming out of here into the softer sugar sand, we just did the, uh, the step length measurement. It's two of my steps. One of the actual tracks in between hops was three and a half of my step lengths. And, uh, and I was taking big steps. In addition to that, we've got evidence of the bipedal gate coming through here. And it looks to me like it probably rained on top of this individual's foot um, afterwards. The bottom line is, is um, I'm almost six feet tall. I'm just under six feet. And uh, this individual has twice the step length in a normal speed of gait. And in a hop, it has three and a half times the step length of, of my own track. Okay. Okay, we're... This one has one, two, three and a half of my steps in between its single contact. And then, like it hopped or something, and then this one is twice my step length. To this, one, two, to this. And I'm trying to walk a tightrope, but it's difficult. One, two, and a little more, actually, into this one. And then, uh, actually, Melanie stepped in the next one, but that's okay. That's a Bigfoot moving off. He broke a few branches to let me know that he's not okay. There is no precedence for any of this. We're breaking new ground every time we capture one of these creatures on film. And here lately, we've been catching them very clear. The Florida skunk ape is real, but it's not just that. There are different types, and on this day, I'm literally staring at a creature that has its hand around a tree. It's standing in a four foot deep creek. The bush in front in the foreground is approximately six and a half feet. I estimate the creature to be between 12 and 14 feet tall. At this point, I'm doing my best to point him out to Melanie. This individual is standing in a four foot creek. So he's in the water and the brush around in the, the right foreground angle is right around six to six and a half feet. We're estimating this creature somewhere between 12 and 14 feet tall. Now here you can see the camera is struggling to read what it's recording. And it does appear that there's more than one, but we're gonna take a look at this one individual and, uh, and you guys are just gonna be amazed because what I'm seeing is a giant greenish blue and sometimes gray garden troll with like a pointy head. And uh, in this particular frame, you can actually see what I was staring at when I pointed it, you know, pointed him out to Melanie so she could film him for us. 
right now the creatures are in this area specifically because they love apples and we know that and so after four years of interacting giving these creatures apples most of the time um, when we show up they uh they just come you know we we make the the designated sounds that uh that mean apples are here to the creatures and uh, and we did that by establishing those uh, parameters in our experiments early on we don't change what we do we do it the exact same way every time and when the creatures present themselves for interaction so that we can film them they get rewarded it's that simple the and that's what melanie's remarking about in this footage am i on the right angle am i in the right lane i'm looking at the creature she's having trouble identifying it and she's pointing her camera at it. This is how we've been doing it for a very long time. I study the film, so a lot of the time I see the creatures, but most people don't because they don't study the film. I do. I'm seeing these creatures in real time, and then we're zooming in on them, and sometimes we're catching them with the zoom lenses. Some of these shots are from several hundred yards away, in which We've caught the creatures in these positions in various locations within our research area. And so we make note of where they were captured before and try to duplicate the experiment again. Here's one successful experiment. So we're on the crypto reality camp out and I'm shooting footage uh, while we're on a hike in between tracking areas and it turns out the creatures were around us um, as you can see we've got a bunch of noise there but if we really look there's an achromatic gray hominoid staring at us now there are several creatures in this footage none come out like this guy where we can plainly see that these achromatic hominoids are spying on us as we're walking through their habitat. Again, this is where we're camping. And in this frame, you can see that thing ain't there anymore. Now you see me, now you don't. Based on our thermal studies and what can be viewed just in this clip, you can plainly see that this individual hiding in the bushes, by the way, he's around 10 feet tall, uh, is also clearly displaying the ability to self-regulate body temperature as he is not glowing hot with thermal signature. This is typical in the groups that we study where a few of the individuals, and they tend to be the largest individuals, do not show up on standard thermal devices. This isn't every creature and a lot of study still has to be conducted, but I believe we've conclusively shown this through repetitive documentation with thermal devices that there are creatures that somehow show no heat signature, like this one. So here I am uh, with uh, like 15 people around me uh, on the trail and, uh, and everybody's looking for Bigfoot and, uh, and I'm in the background filming the creature. Uh, one of them, anyway. Um, this is one of the ones that was observing the 168 hike on the very first hike. And, uh, and we managed to catch him on our thermal. Um, you can plainly see that uh, nostril and then nostril, but this is going to be the eyes. And you can see that. You can even see there's eyeballs in there. Um, you got a little bit of the mouth line. Now watch how that mouth opens in between frames. There it's shut, and we can see the eyes a little bit better in both nostrils, the bridge of that nose, and, uh, and we've got that very distinct human-type bridge on an ape-style musculature here. So it's, it's very big nostrils, and then in the next frame, boom, you can see where the lower lip kind of drops open, and, uh, and we've got this creature in its mouth is now open craziness right 
just standing there watching everybody. So there really is no precedent for what we're about to show you in this film today. That individual is about 175 yards away from me, and it appears to be the exact same type of individual that I saw in this encounter, except the one I saw was approximately nine feet tall. The individual in this clip appears to be somewhere between 12 and 14 feet tall. That's 175 yards away. You can plainly see that individual standing there, staring at our group. 12 to 14 feet. That's my estimate. We stood right there. Several of us. I distinctly remember as all our cameras were dying, uh, several of us saying that, you know, we were seeing things in that tree line over there. And, um, and my, my gaze was fixed on this individual here. And, uh, and I shot, you know, as many clips as I could. And the sun was in my eyes, but um, we managed to get him. Despite all of our telephoto lens cameras having died as we arrived in this prayer. So in this particular frame, you can see that rise coming to a point in his hair off the top of his head, just like the one that I saw two years ago. In this shot, you can really see the thing has its mouth open. And uh, comparably, man, it's, it's the same type. It's crazy. Tiny bits of movement here and there, but he's really just standing there watching all of us. It's a great shot. Over the course of the last 10 years of intensive field study, we've had hundreds of encounters. Uh, you're viewing just a few of them. If we've learned anything in the last 10 years, it's that in order to get the creatures to engage with you, you have to spend enough time in their environment to warrant them coming forward. I think early on when I realized that we essentially had a species of man uh, albeit giant, hair-covered, scary, goblin-like creatures, uh, they were responding intelligently, strategically, to every single move that I made strategically to observe them uh, better. Whether it was changing positions, uh, they would alter their positions almost as if they knew exactly where I was going to try to move. And, 
it was the little things like that that taught me over time that what I was dealing with was a higher order intelligence, absolutely. Um, not only problem solving capabilities, but it became apparent over time that the creatures were indeed setting traps for us. Um, they weren't engaging us in any kind of an aggressive way, but you could tell we were being led. I believe on at least two occasions, these creatures planted tracks to see if we would find them and then follow them. When we ended up where I believe we were supposed to be after tracking all of the signs, um, three or four of the creatures growled at us, uh, at which point it was obvious to us that they were there. This behavior in the beginning occurred after we had sen centered many incursions into this spot uh, trying to locate the creatures. It was almost as if they were watching us the entire time and they said, okay, here you go, goofball. Follow this trail. And it was like a trail a blind man could follow. And it led right to them. They revealed themselves. And I halfway think they expected us to leave once we knew they were there. Either way, the jig was up. And the most epic game of cat and mouse started right then between the creatures, the groups of creatures that we were studying in several different places and, uh, and us, crypto reality. And, uh, and so we've, we've been engaging these creatures and we've had members here, you can see one of our members, Jack, uh, down on vacation. There's creatures in the background. Um, Approaching our position. That was actually the day that we got yelled at by what both of us clearly heard. Uh, and, and I would describe as something that it, the sound probably came out of something like what you're staring at right here a giant hominid. Jack's creature was a little bit smaller. <laughs> They get incredibly large. We're only just learning how large and, uh, and fully understanding that will take even more time. We've documented creatures that um, appear to be in excess of 15 feet tall. Some of the creatures uh, appear to be closer to 25 feet in height. So what we found is, uh, is a species, uh, an incredible, giant, intelligent species of, of man-like uh, relic hominoid. I don't know how else to describe it. They're, they're archaic in their design, in their adaptations, in every aspect of how they relate uh, to their own existence. They're natural. They're symbiotic. That's why we don't understand that they're real. Natural and symbiotic relationships with our own planet are outside human perspective. 